Hi everyone, it's me Shakti Sundari and um, here for a little Facebook Live together with Jason Hairstone today. Am I saying it right Jason? Um, I hope I am. So I haven't done this before so I'm just a little bit nervous about the tech. Um, if so, there's a way that I can invite him into the conversation hopefully and we'll be able to have a split screen for the interview. Uh, let me just see if this is going to work. Is that, um, let's see, no, ah, oh, there you are, right, so there's Jason, can't get him up though, where are you, should be able to interview you, can't, nah, Ah, oh, no, I'm just <laughs> showing everyone my, oh, here we go. And let's see. There we go. There you are. Woo. Oh, hold on. <laughs> I hear an echo though. You got it. Do you hear an echo? No. Oh, okay. Is it really annoying? But it's better now. I don't really hear it now. Okay. I haven't got an echo. I don't know if it would help if you had your headphones on. I do have my headphones on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's just see. I'm just, I'm kind of, I've got you on my phone and I've got my computer here so I can just see if it's actually working okay. as well on my page. So anyone who's watching right now, sorry, we're just dealing with the tech for a minute. Um, okay, it's a bit behind. Oh, there's someone. Okay, so there are some people watching. Mm -hmm. Tasha Paul, is that a friend of yours? Who? Like, Tasha Paul? Yes. Yeah, I see a lot okay, of my friends cool. joining. What's up, my good people? What's up, family? <laughs> yes. It's working. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Hey, everyone. So, yeah, I'm just going to say, um, is it hard for you with the echo? Oh, no, the echo is gone now. We good. We're good. Okay, mm -hmm. brilliant. So, um, just want to welcome everyone and say apologies for the slow start with the tech. If I'm looking to my left, it's because I'm looking at my computer because I can't figure out at the moment how to read comments on my phone. Um, so it's all a bit new, but I'm kind of excited to try things this way. Technology is amazing, isn't yes. it? <laughs> I wish I had these tools that, in the 90s. You know. Apart from me getting the timing wrong because I woke Jason up <laughs> at, um, an hour early. It's all good. <laughs> so I've got a habit of doing. I did that good. last time as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make a mental note, check the time, check, check the international time zones. But what is really cool, I've got to keep putting my glasses on, even though I think I look less pretty with my glasses on. I like the librarian um, look. Do you yeah. like it? Should I do that? Yeah, I've always liked the little <laughs> sexy librarian look. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, what I think is really cool is that you are, where are you, in Georgia? Yes, Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta. yes, Atlanta. Yeah, so, Atlanta, Georgia, I'm in London, mm -hmm. uh, so we've got this intercontinental thing going on, which I think is bloody amazing, and, you know, we're connecting this, it's just awesome. And we actually met in, oh, we actually met in person last year. Well, we met yes. in person, having been friends on uh -huh. Facebook. For a while. For a few it's years. It's been a minute, yeah. Yeah. And we had all these little conversations about stuff. Uh -huh. And, you know, we watched each other's journeys and um, oh. dived in and out. And then we met. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we met at a time when I was going through a very difficult yes. time. And Jason, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was like, I could not hide my my sort of sorrow and my pain but you know what I, I, well, I, I want to say this though i actually thought it was beautiful that you were so vulnerable um when i was in your space to me that's beautiful to me when a person can just go with how they're feeling and just allow themselves to cry to me that's beautiful you know and and i'm gonna be honest like i've met a lot of people you know um and 
I was actually telling Raya this about you, that how you're one of the people that I've met that's actually really authentic, you know, about how you feel and, and you showed up in your authentic nature and you allowed yourself to cry and you didn't hide it, you know. And I think that that's a rarity. You know, some, so many of us want to keep up this certain image and we don't allow ourselves to be, you know, in the moment the way we need to be in the moment. So I actually think that that's powerful. Thank you. Although I don't really feel I have a choice, so it's not like. <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of people. You know, but yeah, well, thank you. A lot of people pretend and, and hide things, you know. But I think it takes a lot of courage yeah. to be raw and authentic, and you know. And I've been doing it for so long; it's just natural to me. So I expect other people to be that way. And I always end up being disappointed because I expect people to be the way that I am. That's one of our biggest lessons that I learned from last year. I, have, I, I usually expect people uh -huh. to be like me and see things the way I and, right. and that's a mistake. I can't expect yes, people. I know that one too. Yeah. So I don't really do that anymore. You know, I don't expect people to uh, see uh, things the way that I see it now. Now nah, I've let that go and I just let people show me what their perspective is, you know, because some things to me is just common knowledge or just a natural thing to do. Like being authentic and being raw and being real is just a natural thing for me to do, but it's not so natural for most people. And I, I had yes. to finally accept that. Yeah. You know. I get you. And also, but the thing is, there's not a judgment in that because it's it's like there's not even an awareness that it's not being authentic, Exactly. If you see what I right. mean. Right. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. Because, um, you know, and that's the thing. When I work with people, when I work with clients, we do the self-mastery coaching. It's like, it can be very uncomfortable for people because I get right to the root. It's no games. It's like, we're going to get right to this space to it. that yeah. you've been denying for your entire yeah. life. No more denial in this space. So I force people to face those things that they've been running, they've been running away from. And, and the thing is, when you're authentic and you're raw um, in your way of being, you're always facing yourself. So I'm always facing myself, no matter how uncomfortable it may be. You know, yeah. Um, but we all have our blind spots. You know, you have blind spots. And, Absolutely. You know, but for but for the most part, um, Absolutely. I'm showing up in my authentic state, and I'm not pretending at all. It's not, you know. We weren't going to talk about this, mm -hmm. you know, but actually, it does bring up an interesting question. So I'm going off tangent already. I was going to ask you about. I was only going to ask you three questions, <laughs> Jason, but. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you about this now. All right. I'm going to ask you about authenticity. Uh -huh. So what, why don't people show up as authentic and what happens when we do? Well, the reason why people are not authentic is because they're afraid of being judged for who they really are. So yeah. I just don't care. <laughs> you know, so like um, a lot of family members, they think that I'm weird. They don't understand what I'm doing. Um, I've had friends disown me, like people I've been close with for since elementary who don't even pick up the phone anymore because I'm too weird and stuff like that. So I just don't care. So you have to love yourself enough to the point where you don't care if no... Because here's the thing. If someone can accept you for your authentic self, they don't need to be in your circle anyway. You want people in your circle who are accepting you for the real you. Because now they're nourishing the real you. If you're showing up with your representative, they're going to be nurturing a representative of yourself who is not really you. And you're going to feel... I've heard that phrase before, representative. Mm -hmm. So like a fate of... Exactly. <laughs> Most of us are showing up with a representative because we create a representative that's comfortable, that, go, that stays in line with the, whatever the circle believes or that stays in line with that circle so we can get uh, approval. But see me, I yeah. don't care if you don't like me. So but have you always been like that? Pretty, pretty we much. Um, not as much as I am now, but I've always had that in me because I grew up, I was an outcast. So when I grew up, I could have been popular. It, was, it wasn't like I was a nerd. And I had, 
I had popular people wanting to recruit me to come hang out with them, and I never chose to do it because I didn't want to get drunk and get high and run the streets. I just didn't want to. I was into my music and sports. So um, in that regard, I, was, I always stood in my authenticity in some form of fashion. But even back then, I was still using somewhat of a representative to fit in in some areas, but not, sure. not fully. But now I'm just me, and I don't care what you think. And you could be, my, we could be friends, we could be colleagues. If we don't agree on something, we just don't agree. And that's okay too. It's okay to have different perspectives as well. But my thing is, <clears throat> I'm not going to hold back who I am to make you feel comfortable. You feel what I'm saying? Well, and it's probably also about making yourself feel comfortable too, isn't it? Like, because you spoke about the need the human need that we feel to belong or to, to not be rejected, to, um, you know, to be accepted into the group. Right. Like there's a fear there, isn't there, yep. of, of, of not being loved, ultimately. Right, but here's the thing. When you step enough in your power, you don't need validation from the group. I don't need no validation from no ethnic group, no um, country, no religious group. I don't need the validation. I know I'm powerful. You feel, you see what I'm saying? So for example, yeah, I want to bring this up. So, Go on. you know, growing up as a black man in the hood, um, when I was younger. What does that mean when you say in the hood? The like, hood what was your neighborhood? Like? It was kind of rough. So when you say, when you say the hood in America, it's like a neighborhood is kind of rough. It was kind of, was some violence going on, it was drug dealing. Like guns and yes. drugs yes. and shit like yes. that. Um, I remember one time in high school, they put everybody in the auditorium and they locked us in and everybody's throwing drugs and weapons under the seats. They did a raid, a drug raid in the high school. So it was like that. So, wow. so here's the thing. So growing up as a black man in the hood, you know, I would only date black girls, right? You, it's, it's like this, black or Puerto Rican girls. So if you black in a black, a young boy in the hood, if you, if you date black <clears throat> girls and Puerto Rican girls, it's all good. But if you were to date a white girl, it's a negative connotation that comes with that. Oh, he like white girls, right? So get this, so my, what's the, huh? What's, so what was wrong with that? You see, because was, in, in, the, in, in, in the black collective, collective culture, it's almost like you're disowning your race if you date a white girl. So here's the thing. I was only pretty much attracted to black girls growing up and Puerto Rican girls, right? So I, I, I was attracted to them. But it was, it was two times I had attraction to white girls, these two white girls, my whole entire life as a youth. And I didn't pursue them because I didn't want to get ridiculed with the saying, oh, he like white girls. Because it's like a, literally like a negative connotation. So okay. black, young black boys in the hood it may not even be a white girl. It could be a Chinese girl, another race. A lot of times we hold back our desires to connect with another race because we're afraid of being ridiculed by our own collective. And when I brought this up on Facebook one day, I made a post about this. And I said that because I don't hear no other black man talking about this. This other black guy says, you know what? There were a couple of times I didn't try to connect with a woman from another race because I didn't want to get ridiculed. And I held myself back. And that could have been a loving, oh. that could have been a loving experience. Oh. Do you see what I'm saying? So here's totally right. So I'm, I'm I'm making a point. I'm coming around. So back then, I would make choices based off of how the collective would see me. So now I just don't care. So when I have a white girlfriend, the black collective once again I get attacked. See why you dating white women? All oh, so you do you must hate your own race. It's all this energy like that, and it's like no. What's happening is now that I'm an adult, I don't care what y'all think. I'm gonna love who I want to love. And I don't care. And people have this idea. They think that I only date white women. It's like I had three black girlfriends, three white girlfriends, and a Portuguese girlfriend. So, but it's, but it's, but it's weird to me that people are mad at me or anybody else for dating someone of another race. We should be celebrating love no matter what Absolutely. form it comes in. I don't care if it's a man loving a man, a woman loving a woman, or a Chinese man loving a Polynesian woman. Like... We should be celebrating love. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something about that as well, uh -huh. actually. I've got to, yeah, um, that kind of adds to that, which is, you know, I was really blessed. I know that probably some of your friends 
like probably any of your friends that are watching this are probably more black people than white mm -hmm. people, right? So I just want to tell, and I probably sound like some posh white English woman. Well, right? well actually, <laughs> so, I have a pretty decent mixture of uh, all kinds of different races, okay. though, pretty, pretty good mixture. But um, the point I was going to make is that um, I was really blessed because I went to um, a school that was international. So I grew up in an environment where I was in a classroom with literally Chinese, black, African, American, um, European, like every continent was represented, every skin color was represented, every language was represented, and that was my normal. And I didn't actually see skin color. I actually didn't see skin color. So in, in the sense that the first boy I ever kissed was um, a Nigerian boy. I loved him so much. I was I remember him like, I just loved him, um, and he had black skin, obviously. But in my head, I didn't, I didn't see the color of his skin at all. It just wasn't a thing. It was just the boy I loved, mm -hmm. just the boy that I loved. And then I moved back to England. I was living abroad, and suddenly I noticed all these attitudes of differentiation based on race, based on color, based on uh, where you lived. And I was like, whoa! Like it was so weird. And then. Like way much later when I moved to the States, um, I lived in the States for six years. I lived in uh, Virginia for a while. And I was absolutely like, so now I live in London, which is very diverse. Yeah, it's very diverse. And I, I was absolutely shocked because there was such a racial division there. Mm -hmm. Like literally there was a black part of town, Charlottesville, Virginia this was, there was a white part of town. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there was hardly any mixing happening. And there was like one or two couples that were mixed but they got odd looks from people and I was really shocked. Yeah. And I also felt um, like a lot of hostility coming at me simply because I was a white woman from um, black people. And I didn't understand it. I didn't know why I was getting it. Like what's going on? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know why we've gone off on this topic of race actually, but um, <laughs> I guess the point that we're both trying to make is, is like, you know, if you had your eyes closed, you wouldn't be able to see that external facade which is just like a skin suit that we all put on like we're born into different skin right. suits right take take the skin suit off there's a soul there's a heart right. you know there's a spirit there's an embodiment of the divine that's kind of that's my understanding really basically so you know i don't give a fuck like what color you, you are it's like here's your heart here's your soul here's your spirit let's connect or not right exactly that's how i feel and 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 in saying that i'm not going to take away i know that racism exists I know the white supremacy exists and all these things in America and the system is set up for us, for obstacles for black men and black women. I know all of this, but at the same time, with all that being said, right. I'm not going to hold back my love for someone simply because a group of people think that I should. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous to me. And yeah. if you travel, if you start to travel the world, what you'll find is I've been all over the world and there's beautiful people from all. And why we always make it a black and white thing. There's Balinese people, there's Portuguese people, there's Polynesian people. I, I've, <laughs> I've met some people from new, some Kiwis from New Zealand that were wonderful. It's like, Jason, when you come to New Zealand, you can stay at our home. Right now, like I got somewhere I can go in New Zealand. So I, I get love and share love with everybody. And I really don't understand. And I know it's, it's, because of a trauma to where we, we are this way. But we have, to, we have to really look at ourselves and ask ourselves, why are we so concerned about if somebody is gay or dates another race or practices a certain religion? Why do you care? I don't care. If you care too much, that means you're not focusing enough on yourself, period. Period. Mm -hmm. You need to start focusing on yourself. You know, yourself. actually, Jason, in a way, this, this does kind of feed into one of the things I wanted to ask you about, mm -hmm. um, which does in my head anyway, which is I, I did want to ask you about your perspective on um, what's going on at the moment in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, so, you know, let's just state it. Like, there's this um, bombing that's happening in Syria, and there's a lot of drama and a lot of talking about it in the public consciousness. Mm. There's a lot of fear. <coughs> right. And um, there's a lot of division. There's a lot of separation. There's a lot of projection, like, you know, of othering, like making the other wrong. 
and defending against. So, you know, those ways in which we separate ourselves and divide ourselves and create conflict, I can see in a way how that does in a way relate to the race argument of sort of separation, division, projection. So, but I guess my question to you was like, especially because you're in the States and I'm in the UK and, you know, there's been this sort of united political front between our political leaders as well. But more to the point, like how do we as... Um, you know, individuals who are doing our best to walk a path of consciousness, how do we respond to something like that? Like, where do we put our attention? Where do we give our energy? How do we bring change from a really loving, aligned place? We stop putting all of our attention and focus on the war, and we come together and love each other. And I know that sounds cliche, and people are going to think that sounds woo-woo, but here's what people don't understand. And I'm going to give you an example. Let's just, let's just talk about energy for a minute. Most of us don't understand that we are energetic beings and energy fuels everything. So for example, yeah. I just did the reascension retreat with Jay English and I brought out this new exercise called the twin flame circuit, which me and Raya put a video up of us doing it where we just laying together our legs together, like connected and we're just sitting in silence. Now I pulled this, this new tool out at the retreat and I had men and women do this together. And what happened was it generated this energy in between them like that was going up and down their bodies and it took them deep into a bliss state to the point where they didn't want to get up. This one, this one couple, they literally stay in the same position for like two, we did the exercise for like 15 minutes. They stay in that position for like two hours. Then they got up in a lotus position and held each other for another hour, for about three hours. So the energy in the room, it created a vacuum and a vortex of love, a feeling literally that you can feel in your heart. So, can feel it. so that energy is a force field that affects the environment. So mm -hmm. if everyone engaged in activities that increase the energetic frequency of love and bliss, if everybody did this who's worried about the war, that energy alone would start to shift the environment. This is quantum physics. And a lot of people don't believe in this. Everybody's into, into the intellect about what's happening in the world and in life when yeah. actually we're dealing with quantum physics and energy affects the environment. So if you have a large collective of people revving up the love energy, that vibrates into the environment and it causes things to shift. And this is facts. You can research quantum physics for yourself. And I'm not a quantum physics expert, but how do I know? Because I experience it and I live this. And I know the type of energy that we create in our retreats. It shifts people literally. It's transformational. What I teach and what I share. So how does that? Oh, go ahead. Go what I was about to say is what I share and what I teach is not just some trendy things. These are actually, actually transformational tools that will change your life and yourself. It's not a game. Okay, so what are you going to say? I get you, and I understand. I, I totally understand that. You know, I, I know it mm -hmm. as well. Um, but I can hear people who might be watching saying, but how does that translate into action? Isn't that just being passive and not doing anything um, mm -hmm. useful to create change or to oppose what's wrong, you know? Okay, so let's talk about that. What I'm talking about doing yeah. is being an alchemist. I li I'm an alchemist. So therefore, in a situation when there's chaos and drama, even if I have to swallow my pride, I'll take an action to harmonize the situation. So here's the thing. If everyone came together in that energy, right, it would start to affect the environment. And then what would happen out of that energy, inspiration to create would come into that energy. For example, with right. me and Jay English, yeah. whenever I go visit Jay English in Tallahassee, Florida, we literally sit in the living room and we just start talking. And we be like, yeah, the energy, and what if we did? And then all of a sudden, because we're, <laughs> we've created this energy field, right? And it's a flow that yeah. happens between our conversations. You can feel the energy. And all of a sudden, an idea will come in. Oh, what if we did this? Then he'd be like, yeah, what if we did this? And we start to create in that energy. So what's happening yeah. is the solutions that we need to create to make the world better comes falls into the energy of amplified love frequency but if you're not in that energy the right. solutions don't fall in right and 
Yeah. This is facts. Me and Riot, the other day we were sitting here talking. And same thing. Because she holds enough of her energy, I hold enough of my energy. There's a bounce back of energy. We create this bubble. And then all of a sudden, I started seeing things and recognizing things I never recognized before. Because in that frequency, it brings you clarity. And you start to tap into something higher than yourself. So people don't understand. When you are operating in the frequencies of fear and worry, you are not pulling any inspiration in that can be a solution. Because you're vibrating at a low vibrational frequency. There is no inspiration coming in through that frequency. Yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. almost like what I would call like a dead frequency. I, that's the wrong word. I shouldn't say dead. But it's not vibrant enough to pull in ideas and inspiration. Yeah. Totally get it. Totally get it. <laughs> um, question back to mm -hmm. you. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff will come out of, um, yes, but uh, mm -hmm. I've been hurt. Yes, but mm -hmm. they killed my cousin. Mm -hmm. Yes, but they shot my brother. Yes, but mm -hmm. they're threatening my livelihood. Mm -hmm. You know, those kinds of yes, buts, mm -hmm. right? Now, that's the thing. See, when you're, those, when you're in those situations like that, that's where it's the toughest work to do when it's affecting you directly. See, what, 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 what's fascinating to me is us Americans, this bombings and Syria all stuff doesn't affect us directly, right? So here's the thing. Let me tell you what really happens. There's bombings happening every day and all types of killings going on in the Middle East. But when the news markets certain activity on purpose to us, it's to rile us up to get us in the frequency of fear on purpose so we could be controlled, yeah. right? So yeah. here's the thing. A lot of Americans, and I don't know why I'm going off of this tangent, but just stay with me. A lot of Americans <laughs> will say stuff like, yeah, I think we should go over there and just bomb them all. And da -da -da -da. But see, you're speaking from a space where war is not affecting you directly. I have a friend that grew up in war. And she was telling me about what she went through. She's like, I would never uh, wish this on anybody. It's not a game. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> so for you to haphazardly just talk about war like that, like it's a video game, is just not cool at all, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, when it comes to death, now I'm not going to lie, if, if a lot of my family members were dying like that in a war, it would affect me in a, in, a, in a way that would definitely affect my emotions. But the only thing I can say that can help yeah. you to deal with that is to understand what death really is. It's a transition. If you look at... Oh, that's a big one. If you look at death as the yeah. end then it's, it's more challenging for you to get over the loss of people that you love. So it's easier for me because I look at death as a transition. But when there's brutal deaths like that, that makes it even worse. So it, it'd be even more challenging. But the only thing I would say is, um, if that was happening to me, I would say for people who are experiencing that, celebrate their life when they were alive. You know, like in ancient cultures, we would celebrate when people would die, pass away. It wouldn't be like a mourning. I mean, you probably have to mourn in your own way even back then. But what I'm saying is, when I, if, if I die, I want people to celebrate my life. I don't want people to be all sad. Like, I want people to be like, Jason was a good dude. He was a man of his word. He was whatever, you know, whatever comes to your mind that made you feel good about me. I want people to celebrate my transition. You know, so that's what I would say. Yeah. We have to change our idea of what of what we call death and start to look at the bigger picture too. Cause sometimes. Yeah. But I, uh -huh. Jason, I think that's a bit kind of, I don't know. We're going off on one. A okay. Bit okay. And also like, if we're talking, <laughs> 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 you know, if we're talking about, the, you know, how to respond as a, as a loving conscious person to the world situation, like saying, don't be afraid of death is, I don't know. I don't think that's going to cut it really, but yeah. the stuff that you were talking about in terms of vibration, that really makes sense. So it's like, how do we get ourselves back into that vibration? If we do feel fear, if we do feel afraid, you know, my, um, my daughter was maybe not going to be able to come back from a school trip to Cyprus because they were going to bomb Syria. And actually they did bomb them the next mm -hmm. day. So she might not have been able to fly home. Uh, so I felt a flicker, I felt a I flicker of anxiety yeah. because it affected me personally. Definitely. But actually, you know, mostly I stayed in the vibration of truth, uh, um, not truth, of, of faith and just, 
you know, I felt really calm in myself because I'm doing practices that keep me in that vibration. So I didn't go into this like, Ooh, you know, but I could have done. So, so like, what do we do to bring us back into that place that you were talking about when we do feel those human fears, those human anxieties, you know, they're real. Um, mm -hmm. How do we, how do we reorient ourselves? You know, you talk about self mastery. Mm -hmm. So like, how do we do that? How do we work with ourselves? Well, here's the thing. The only thing you can do <clears throat> is sit with the anxiety and literally sit in it in silence. So whenever I feel anxiety or fear or something like that, I literally just sit in it until it passes. I allow myself to feel it all. See, here's the thing. A lot of times we don't clear a lot of our traumas is because we don't take the time to sit in the uncomfortable feeling of how it feels until it passes, because it will pass. There is no... Um, and I trust me, I didn't try it. There is no way you can stay angry at somebody forever. <laughs> it, it's going to pass. So here's the thing. When I'm feeling a negative energy like that, I just literally sit in it and I try to... Because the reason why I sit in it is because I'm trying to burn out the fuel of it and just sit in it and let right. it burn, let it burn, and eventually it will burn. But see, when you don't face it, the fear... Oh, my God, like, say if I was scared in fear about the war. What I would do is I would just sit with myself, okay? And sit in the fear, literally. And just... Are you meditating? Are you breathing? Yeah, you yes, breathing. Like, I could breathe. Yeah, focus on your breath. Like, and just, yeah. Because if you're... So if you're anxious, your breath is tight. So you want to open your energy up in your breath. So that helps mm -hmm. with anxiety. Just sit in it. Allow yourself to feel afraid and all those feelings that you're feeling and just allow yourself to sit in it. And what you'll notice is eventually will burn out. If you if you yeah. if you sit in it, but well, most people they'll just let themselves fill it, and then they'll watch more news and amplify more and amplify more, and then <laughs> talk about the fear. And then so when the fear comes, I just try to burn out all the fuel from it, and 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 help to make it pass faster by sitting in it. Yeah. So what you did with your daughter yeah. is what I would have done. There's nothing you could do but just to sit and just hold her in your heart. There was nothing else you could do. You see? Yeah. yeah. And if my if somebody I love is in a situation like that, that's all I can do. All I could do is sit in my heart and hold them there and hold space. The only thing you could do for somebody that you love that's in a tight situation is to hold space for them sometimes. That's it. Yeah. And it really does make a difference. You know, it's... Um... Yeah, it makes a huge difference, like how, well, it, it's all the difference, isn't it, basically, like what, how we're feeling inside mm -hmm. and what, like, what, you, what we're vibrating, it, it is then immediately reflected back to us outside. Yes. You know, I keep, I keep witnessing this happen again and again on such subtle levels as well. It's like, whoa, I didn't realize I was that powerful, and I keep, like, realizing my power more and more, and it's like, bloody hell, you know. Be careful. Be careful what you think. Be careful what you, f like, not be careful what you feel, but be careful what you do with your emotions. Um, be careful what you say. Well, I, I want to say this too, like, and here's the thing. I want people to understand that if some negative emotions or feelings comes inside of you, don't get scared and think that, okay, my, my, my vibration is lowering now. Oh, I'm about to mess up my reality. Just, <laughs> just, just here's the thing. It could, just let it be a phase. Just breathe through it. You know, and yeah. let it come in and, and just go like a cloudy day. Just just breathe through it. So when I'm feeling, I have my days where the energy feels yucky because I'm an empath. I feel everything. So I'm like, so yeah. I talk to myself and I'm like, okay, this is just a yucky little phase. This is going to go away. Let me just sit in it. And it always goes away. And another thing I want to say, too, for people who are concerned about the war. Oh, my God, what's happening? Become the alpha. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, okay, you're worried about war. Do the exact opposite. Take actions that are the exact opposite of the frequency of war, which is do loving things. Yes. If enough people did the opposite of what they don't like, it would phase all yeah. those things out. Yeah. It would harmonize. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So totally. I'm not going to focus on the war and sit over here and put all my attention on that. Because if I do, it's gonna bring my frequency down. Now I'm affecting my environment. Yeah. If I stay in that frequency, if you stay in it too long, right, and you, and you fester in it, now your reality is gonna to start to bring you more reflections of more fear. That's how it works, it's yeah. quantum physics. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
What do you say? I mean, we've kind of. What do you say to the to the to the argument or the proposition that actually that level of conflict and sort of opposition that we're seeing is simply a reflection of our own inner conflict Facts. and opposition? Facts. Let me break it all the way down. All this, all everything that's happening in the world with the wars and the way we treat animals and all this and Monsanto and all this stuff is a collective reflection of our, our frequency. And what is, okay, so here's the thing. Let's just talk about America. So, okay. American culture thrives on fear. When you turn on the television, all you see is promotion of fear, period. So therefore, yeah. Yeah. since a lot of people are influenced by TV, kill your television, by the way, what happens is in the collect, the American collective, the primary frequency is fear. So that energetic pulse of fear fuels yeah. wars, Monsanto, the treatment of animals. If we shift our collective frequency from fear to love, Monsanto would fade yeah. away, the wars would stop, all those things would stop. Because collectively, our energetic pulse will be calling for a different reality. Yeah. We never want to. We never want to point the finger at ourselves. We always want to blame the government and point at everything. When it's no, it's our collective yeah. energetic frequency that we are projecting <laughs> that is fueling the things we don't we do, we, that we don't like. But then we want to go out and fight. We want to go out and fight everything we don't like. Right? I hate this protest march. No, what you need to do yeah. is coming to a loving way of being. If everybody in America did that. Because here's what people don't understand. The government or system that you don't like, the only way they're existing is because they're feeding on your fuel. So if a system is controlling, it has to feed on the fuel. Controlling um, entities feed off of fear. If you have no fear, they have no fuel and they can't exist. It's just like a bully. If, a, if somebody's trying to bully you, bully you and you don't show the bully fear, they're going to stop bullying you and they're going to go bully somebody else. But if you show fear, what's the bully going to do? He going to bully you every day for your lunch money. A bully in high school tried to bully you? I've got, huh? I got that, that, that tagline that you just said in my head now. Uh -huh. So if you've got no fear, they've got no fear. Exactly. They, they, can't, they can't... The governments and these war organizations, they feed off of your fear, which is their fuel. That's how they, they harvest our energy. Which is fear. If you take, does that? What? I'm sorry. <laughs> does that mean that you think there's a they that is external to us? Because like some theories are like everything is us. So everything I see is me. So the way you're talking is like there's some kind of they which is other to me. Well, here's the thing. Just like you, yeah, is a collective consciousness, but you're an individual reflection. You are who you are, and I am who I am. So there's a there's a cut yeah. there's a collective and an individual expression. So there are certain individual expressions that are vamp, vamp that are vampires that are parasitical. It's just like a tapeworm. A tapeworm is that be that will be inside of your inside of your stomach. It's part of consciousness because it exists, but it's feeding off yeah. of the food in your body. Yeah. So that's what the governments yeah. and all these systems are. They are parasitic organizations that feeds off of our fear. If we step out of the state of fear, they will have no power. It would be like, Burr. it's just like the bully. The parasitic organizations are organizational bullies, just like the mafia. When the mafia take over your neighborhood, how do they control your neighborhood? With fear. They come into your establishment and be like, I want 20% of what you're making for your protection. And what you do, you give over the money. You see what I'm saying? And they, control, they set up shop in your neighborhood and take over your neighborhood. It's the same thing governments do. It's a parasitic way of being. And people are doing it on so many different levels, being parasitical like that. And, and feeding off of people's fears. It's happening on several levels. So, so the way out of it is love, though, and vibration. Yes. That's basically it. That's, that's all you're yes. saying. I mean, that's not all you're saying. I mean, that is what you're saying, but it, like, that's yep, it. That's it. Yeah. 
Um, I just want to go, right, and see, because I've just been, it's really hard to look at you and look here and just see if there's any comments or questions that people might Yeah, there's a lot of comments. Upset. There's a lot of comments popping up. Yeah, a lot of things. Um, yeah. Well, uh, okay, there's nothing that I can respond to right now. Okay. Um, just wanted to check. Are you, can you see comments? Yeah. Um, but let me um, pull up on my computer too, so I can see yeah. separately. Okay, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just um, shift to something else because okay. I think we've done that one about vibration. Okay, okay. Now, although we might come back around to okay. it. Okay. Um, but if you see anything you want to respond to, you know, let's do that too. Because I really also wanted to ask you this. Um, I guess I won't go to the third question. I'm going to go to my first question, which was the original thing I wanted to ask you about today, uh -huh. which was, you know, the work that you're doing as a self-mastery coach, as an energy healer and all of that, you are helping people kind of walk through traumas, helping people find more satisfaction, helping them find their truth, their power, um, but my question is, I suppose, about your own story a little bit and and how you got to be doing this. And in particular, um, if you've had the experience of, because I'm really fascinated at the moment with this kind of theory that I'm working around called the gift, yeah. which is when we face really difficult situations in life, actually they have within them the sort of the kernel of a really great opportunity for our growth and our blossoming into who we're meant to be. So, so what, like, I've kind of just seen this in my own life, like things that I judged at the time to be the most awful circumstance and the most, you know, like taking on the victim role or feeling like I was being punished or something feeling unfair or not going the way I wanted it. But then what I've realized is that all of those of things were actually massive opportunities that they, they had this like amazing gift inside them for me to grow, to become more of who I am, to step into my power more, to see more clearly. So um, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I wonder if you've had a, like situations like that in your life when it feels like everything's gone shit, tits up kind of, and actually you've come out of that and had a massive realization or it's put you into the path that you've come onto now in your life, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, definitely. And this is what I teach. I mean, when things happen to me that bring extreme pain, part of me get, actually gets excited because I know that the, a big shift is about to occur. But the thing is, the reason why I can step into the shift that needs to happen is because I accept what happened and I, I look for the lesson within the pain. So when something tragic yeah. happened, there's always, like you said, there's always a jewel there. So what is the jewel here? There's something here for me to catapult yeah. off of to grow. Yeah. You know? so, for, yeah. so for me, um, you know how they say, you know, I've read several articles that talk about the, the path of the shaman, and they always say that the shaman is always initiated by something tragic that happens in their lives to snap them into it in, most, in a lot of cases. What has happened to right. me, so in 2009, I had a truck driving dro job that I would drive at night, and I fell asleep at the wheel, and I crashed into a police officer that was attending another accident. So I, I lost my two front teeth. These are fake. So I'm boom. Um, Whoa. Yeah blood everywhere and I was just a cut under here and I, at that moment I lost I lost my job my apartment my car I lost everything so when that happened all I had with the sit all I had to sit with was myself and let me tell you a story at this time I started my my um psychic ability started awakening right before this happened so a week before that accident I got a message clear as day when I was driving one night and it said, you need to quit this job. And I was like, how am I going to pay my bills? I got a nice apartment in Duluth. I got my new car. What are you talking about? A week later, the accident happened. So when I... Were you doing any of this stuff then? Or was this like just I, at the beginning of your Yeah, Yeah, journey? I wasn't doing any... I wasn't really helping people like this on this level. I was just... I started to have certain experiences though that had happened. Okay. Yeah, so... Just out of the blue? Like no... Prior no, because because right practice. right before the accident, I connected with the woman within my first sacred sexual experience, and this is why I teach about sacred sexuality because she activated me. So her energy when it activated me, she saw visions of us in a past life. 
I'm calling her by another name and I'm feeling all this energy. I'm crying. I'm like, what is this, where does, where's this emotion coming from? What is this? I was like, what the hell is happening? And then all this stuff started happening between yeah. us. And when that happened, that's what yeah. changed my, my scope about sexuality. And I started teaching people like sex is not just about a physical. This is way bigger than what I thought it was. And this is why I started teaching about sacred sexuality because I actually started experiencing it on a cosmic level. But right after that, not too long after that, the accident happened. I got stripped of everything. Okay. And I'm sitting with myself and I'm just starting to get information just coming into me. I'm like, oh, what's, what's this? And I started sharing when that information started coming. And I, that was the beginning of me doing what I'm doing now. Okay. Raya, hold on one second. Could you hand me my um, charger yeah. from just the... Um, Please, because my phone is about to die. I got to charge it up. Yeah, I just need this part. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. So, so Colleen. Yeah, yeah, so that was the that was the event. That was my initiation, the accident. I lost everything. I had to go to court. I was fined like over $5,000. It was crazy. So you were in debt. You lost your home. You lost your well, car. I lost my apartment. Lost yeah, I lost everything. Like... I got stripped of it, but I needed to get stripped of everything so I could be in space and nothingness. And I had to, I had to remember who I really was because I didn't remember. I, my, my desires and my actions that I were taking, because I was in this hustling mentality before that happened, because I was dabbling in music and film industry during the day, driving at night, doing all this stuff, trying to hustle and, you know, do my thing. But universe is like, no, you forgot why you came here. Bah! Whoa. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. That's that's full on. Did and did you did you have any inkling at the time, or were you in resistance to it? Were you like, why the heck has this happened to me? This is unfair. How I, you know, were you in the story nope. of it then, or were you already seeing it as a gift? At the I was time? already seeing it as a gift because I remember clearly when wow. I cra I crashed into police officer, and then I crashed into the little meridian. It was do 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 do. Right. So I got the car, blood all over the place. And I started walking towards the cop car. It was smashed up in a little ball and it was on fire. I thought I killed somebody, but she actually survived. It was a female cop. She actually survived. So I'm walking towards the scene. I'm seeing the fire. I'm, it looked like a movie. First, I panicked and I said, oh, my God. And then I stopped and I was like, oh, I know exactly why this happened. I didn't listen to that message a week ago. The message clearly said, quit this job. So what I did, I literally walked over towards the car. And there was other cops there. They grabbed me handcuffed me, threw me in the back of the cop car. They was about to beat me. They was about to beat me up. But you know what I did in that moment? I just looked at the cop just like this. And he, he was about to punch me. He went like this. And then he just stopped. I knew that I had to shine with the light of God. And I just, I just surrendered so deep into myself that he couldn't even punch me. Because I was so... Like, all he saw, I know he felt God, because I completely surrendered. I knew that I had to, to get out of that situation without getting beat up by the police. Whew, that's making me go all, like, mm -hmm. tingly. So they, so they took me to the hospital. They handcuffed me to the bed. I was handcuffed to the bed in the hospital. It's like, you're under arrest. You know what I said? I said nothing. I just sat there. I didn't react. I didn't respond. I just literally sat in nothingness. Then... They took me to, you know, the machine where they put your body in and it um, goes in, it comes out. So they check, they check for internal oh, um, the MRI damage. Yes. Yeah, the so they was checking to see if I had internal damage. Now, as I'm going into the machine, I look over and I see this other cop. I think it was the actual, it was the lieutenant. He was just looking at me. And I looked at him once again with, I was just, just, I, I just surrendered. When I, when they took me back to the hotel room, they handcuffed me again. Two cops came into the room, took off my handcuffs and said, the lieutenant said, he, we're not going to arrest him. And then they left. Wow. So I know this is a perfect example of how I'm talking about how energy affects your environment. Now, let's, let's, that's, how, that's how I responded. I didn't react. I responded. If I were reacting in the back of that car, like, you can't hit me. You ain't no cop. I'd have got beat up. If I would have been, been in the hospital, like, take this handcuff off me. This is unlawful then I probably got arrested. Yeah. So I knew I had to just completely surrender to what was happening to get out of it. And I just surrendered and accepted it all. So everybody that's watching, when you're in a situation that's real tight like that, the best thing to do is just surrender to it. Don't try to fight it. Completely surrender. 
and allow it to pass in its most efficient way that it can. Because if you react to it, it's going to make it worse. I really feel what through what you've just told me though, um, like a moment of pure grace. Yes. And and also, um, like you say, surrender. And people may be thinking, "Oh God, that's like really weak, isn't it?" But actually, what I, again, what I hear and feel is immense power in that going into yourself and like you were kind of describing like allowing your essence like to rest in your essence mm -hmm. like you knew in that moment that you won with the divine right uh, i you know what i've never surrendered that deep before in my life but i knew i had to do it like i was completely surrendered like there was no mind like it was just straight Complete nothingness. Mm. I fell into yeah. a deep state of complete everything and nothing at all. I experienced yeah. that feeling. And I just sat in it. And I, I knew I had to do it for my survival. Now, people think surrender is weak, right? How is surrender yeah. weak when a cop had his fist ball about to punch me in the face and he stops like this? Mm. That's weakness? No, that's mm -hmm. power. Because I was shining the yeah. light of God so deeply in that moment that it affected him. Yeah. He was angry. I just hit his, his fellow cop car is in a car on fire that I just ran into. And me surrendering so deeply stopped him from punching me in the face. Yeah. Now, you can call that weak yeah, if you want to. <laughs> well it's an understanding it's i guess it's having the understanding of what really was happening there which is in a way jason left the building yes as it were you know and um what was in you look that sounds a bit weird but like you were filled with the entirety of the universe in completely way, in, that in that moment that's yes i was yeah. not jason harrison i was the yeah. only way I can describe it is I was complete space. Yeah. I was space. And yeah. space full of God. Like I was just, I just surrendered. Beautiful. <clears throat> and I, I, just, I just wanted to say that the key to a fulfilling life is surrendered actions. And what I mean by that is Mm, go on, yeah. Right now, I'm speaking to you. There's a surrender in my speaking. This is not a mental process. Like everything I'm saying is a feeling, it's consciousness. I'm surrendering to the story, surrendering to this moment. And this is why I know everybody who's watching this can feel me. I know you can feel me. I can feel you totally. Like I know you can feel my yeah. energy. Why? Because I am surrendered in my action. When I make love, I'm surrendered in that action. And this is why my partner can feel every fiber of my soul in the act. Because I'm just not going through a physical motion. I'm surrendered to the spirit of the space within the action. And there's a feeling that comes with that. There's an energetic principle that's felt. There's a frequency, a resonance. Yeah. Um, whenever yeah. I write an article or whatever, it's not a mental process. Here's the subject comes and I fill it out and I write, but then I go back and use my intellect to tighten up the little things, but it's a, it's a surrender, surrendered action. So any mm -hmm. surrendered action, no matter what it is, if you have a surrendered action, whoever's experiencing your action is going to be affected. Yes. So this is, how greatness shows up in life through surrendered action. I love it because it turns everything on its head that we're taught mm -hmm. is the way to be. Mm -hmm. You know, we're t <laughs> it's like, it's kind of frustrating, but we spend our lives going through this education system and the, the world of work and the world of business. And it's all about like, 
you know, got to use my intellect, got to strive, got to try, got to achieve these goals, you know, got to make this happen. And this is like, mm -hmm. whoa, rewind, reverse, surrender, and just be and let life express herself. Oh, you. let's, let, let, okay. Okay, let's talk about that. I'm glad that you brought that up because I was about to take it there, but you just took it there before me. Now, you're a woman, right? You have the womb. Your physical womb is a representation of space. Space is feminine. It's where all things yeah. are created within, right? Yeah. Time is masculine. Time is where you take the action in a linear form. So to, to step into a form of greatness, you surrender to the mother, which is space. You get inspiration to take action in time, which is the father. So I agree with you. Okay, I haven't heard it like that. I haven't heard it like that before. Space is the mother. Time is the father. Time is action. Time, linear time represents taking action in steps. But here's the thing. Hmm. The reason why we're suffering as a society across the board all over the globe is because men are not respecting the mother, which is space. They're not allowing themselves to sit in space and be inspired by space itself, which is stillness, and women who represent the physical representation of space. We, we quiet women. We don't listen to them. Shut up. You're a woman. You're beneath me. And what we're actually doing is we're denying inspiration that can lead to our greatness. This is why they say women are muses, the muse. The f woman is the physical representation of space, of stillness. Your womb mm -hmm. is space where a, a child is birthed within. The space in the cosmos is space where planets are birthed within. Mm -hmm. It's my duty and my job to take your inspiration and create in time. Now, women can create in time as well because we can shift in and out of these principles because you can be in stillness as a man and give birth to things as well. But what I'm saying is primarily your phys physical representation of space. And I'm a physical representation of grounding space in time. The father grounds space in time, in action, in physical. Yep, yeah, I get you. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Fa father um, time, mother is... space. Yeah, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't thought of it in those terms before, but I, I get that. I guess I'm really steeped in... Um, I'm so steeped in goddess mythology at the moment that um, I'm reading a lot right now about sort of, um, yeah, Hindu mythology and Tantra yoga mythology. So I'm with uh, the notion of Kali, the goddess mm -hmm. Kali, I'm sure you're familiar mm -hmm. with as, you know, the void, time, uh, blackness, mm -hmm. everything, the cosmic womb. So I kind of I have that. But what you're saying also makes perfect sense in terms of... Um, my understanding from it. I mean, you know, it's all just playing with ideas anyway, really. But yeah, the idea of the masculine is the one taking, taking action and being directive mm -hmm. and the feminist providing the creative impetus. But yeah, of course our wombs are like the cosmic creation mm -hmm. of all it is. And, um, you know, this is a, another thing that's, uh, that I've been really tapping into personally recently is, is, you know, there's so many layers and it just keeps happening. But like, I just got this knowing on such a deep level that I am, the creative energy of of all of life that I'm an expression of that and everything that moves through me is that and I suddenly realized the immense power that I have and it's not sort of saying you know Shakti this person has the power because it's not mine it's not mine to hold on to you know it's not about how great I am it's about the power of everything that is flowing through me and expressing through me and it's like whoa I understand it now on a deeper level um and a more embodied level and it's like, how could I ever have felt the way I felt like last year when I know this that I know now? Because, you know, I create everything in that sense as the energy of all. Does that make sense? To yes. You? And, I, and with that being yeah. said, I want to say something in, re in regards yeah. to <clears throat> couples, men and women coming together. You yeah. know how it's, it's, 
it's actually social engineering. We've been, we're still kind of operating off of social engineering concept, romantic concepts from the 1950s, um, which is, well, it's kind of changed a little bit because now, because of the dynamics of more women who are career oriented and things of that nature. But the focus of the relationship is more about, well, you need to have enough money or you need to have this and that on a materialistic end before you can qualify to be with me, right? But here's what's interesting about that. If a man and a woman are holding enough of their energy and they're, and they're whole and they believe in themselves and, they, and, they, and they're not leaking a tremendous amount of energy and they can hold their, and they got willpower and they could be committed. If a man and a woman comes together and they understand that part that, that you could be, if you could be committed, hold your energy, have self-esteem, right? And then you come together and you understand that you could come together in your energy and understanding that the woman can give birth energetically to your energetic seed, just like she could give birth to your physical seed. Then you can plant seeds together and grow them through the energy field that you create together. All right. Yeah. So I'm doing that now. So when I'm planting the seed energetically, she's seeing visions now of it. That's how I know the seed is planted. She's like, oh my God, I saw this. I saw. So we cultivate that energy together. So it doesn't matter how much money we have right now, whatever. If we cultivate the energy, what we desire will come, especially if I'm doing this with a woman. See, what I'm doing about myself, I can manifest some things, but it's more powerful if I'm with a woman because a woman represents the physical um. This uh, reflection of space, which is where things are birthed. Yeah. So it's easier yeah. to build with a woman who can hold her own energy because she can give birth right. to your desires. You've mentioned that a couple of times. So holding your own mm -hmm. energy, you've mentioned mm -hmm. that. Holding your own energy. Don't leak your energy. Holding your mm -hmm. energy. So that's. What does that mean? Okay, so for example, your average person probably goes to work, right? 40 hours a week. So they're projecting all their energy at work. All their energy is going towards work. Out to work, out to work. They come home, watch TV. All their energy is going to TV, going to TV. Look at all this energy that's leaking. Now, I spend a lot of time on Facebook, I do, but I also spend a lot of time just sitting in my own energy and holding my energy and sitting with myself. When you sit with yourself and just feel your own energy, you're literally charging your energy up, just like how you would charge your phone up. Every time our phone gets down low, what we do, we charge it back up, but we never do that to ourselves because we don't understand that we're, mm -hmm. we're beings that operate off of energy that needs to be charged up. We don't understand that. So what we do is we give all our attention to the job, all attention to the TV, all attention to Facebook arguments, all attention. All, look, all this is energy going out. When are you ever holding the energy in? <laughs> most people are never holding yeah, yeah, yeah. it. So here's the thing. And most of the time when arguments occur, you're arguing to defend your insecurity. So that's a leak through trauma. Hmm. If you're mm -hmm. sure of yourself, you're not arguing with people. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to prove. I'm not going to sit here and argue. I used to, but you know I don't anymore because I've stepped more into my power. So that means I'm holding more of my energy. Yeah. We have to realize that we have to take time every day to charge our energy up. And I know we're busy. We have careers, spouses, and kids. But you have to find time to sit with yourself at least 30 minutes a day and just sit in your energy and charge yourself up. Because if you don't, yeah. you don't really have enough energy to create anything. Because all your energy is going yeah. to the business you work for, to the spouse, to the kids, to this, to that, to the Facebook arguments, to Instagram, wherever. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, yeah. So much. And I, I want to add something to that, actually, because um, I'm teaching an online course at the moment called Radiant Womanhood. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's based around Kundalini yoga teachings. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been working this field for ages and I'm always learning more and seeing more myself. And so we've talked exactly about how we leak our energy, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's also about what do we do with our sexual energy? Are we just like, you know, basically spraying our sexual energy all over the mm -hmm. place? Are we flirting? You know, what are we projecting? What are we radiating? Like what energy frequency are we holding? Like, and so how do we, because 
actually from the Kundalini Yoga teachings, um, our capacity to radiate is stronger than a man's. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it's like, take care. What, like, what are you choosing to project right now? Like, what, what, what are you radiating? Is it grace? Is it nobility? Is it integrity? Is it um, insecurity? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it? What is the vibration that you're projecting out? And where are you leaking energy by putting yourself into other people's stories? By worrying what they're saying about you? Mm -hmm. By wanting to look a certain way? by you know because also as women we have the capacity to um be much more aware of many things and everybody else's feelings and everybody else's emotions and all that stuff um and the other thing you were saying about how we amplify so the, the woman amplifies so what you give us we amplify so right exactly you come at us with, exactly you know a, a, you know a very clear energy uh, because you've spent time recharging yourself and clearing yourself and you bring that to us in love making or just in interaction we will amplify it for you Facts. if you come at us with you know you haven't cleared your energy field and you've got all these stuff going on within yourself that you haven't um, sort of purged purified or become aware of when you make love to us we will amplify that and reflect it back to you mm -hmm. we'll you know we'll multiply it in the relationship yes so that's how we can create more shadow together yes we can create more love yes and more light together exactly and this is why i always tell women don't ever let no man in your womb who doesn't honor and respect you or who is chaotic you don't let no chaotic man in your womb he's dumping chaotic energy yeah. in your space which yeah. creates chaos yeah. in your space you got so you're gonna give yeah. birth to chaos he just implanted a seed of chaos in you and you're going to give birth to it you're going to he made love to yeah. you it's going to come out of you in some form or fashion. Yeah. Facts. Yeah. Hands up. I've done that. <laughs> I know that. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, well, that's how powerful we exactly. are. But then it's like, honor your power. And this I is why, don't... this is why I made a post the other day. I said, a kingdom cannot be built without a woman standing next to a man who stands in her power. Because the, we, as men, we need women to build a, a kingdom and an empire because she multiplies, like you said, our intentions energetically. Yeah. Yeah. If you go look at any ancient culture or any powerful man who has built an empire, there's a strong, powerful woman right next to him every time. Can't no man build no, build no empire without a strong woman standing in her power, period. We need women to build, but women need us too. You guys need us to plant the proper seed, and we need you to take the proper seed. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That's just answered another question that I had for myself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Listen, Jason, we've been talking for a long time, and I sort of think we should wrap up now, even though okay. I sort of feel like this could go on. <laughs> like, even hey, more. we could do another one, part three. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. I can't see any questions right now to answer. So, um, before we sort of sign off and say goodbye, is um, can you just kind of tell people where to reach you and anything you want to talk about with, with regard to your work? Okay. You can just go to jasonhairston.com and you'll see all my services that I provide. And if you really do some deep work, we could do some work. You know, that's all really I have to say. Um, yeah. Let's do the work. Let's, let's, this is what I want to say. Let's take the okay. time to understand our human technology because that's what we don't understand. We don't understand our human technology, which is the energetic technology. And this is why we keep falling short and we can't seem to grasp mm -hmm. what's actually happening in our lives because we don't recognize the energetic laws. First of all, there's an energetic law in place and we are energetic technology. So, we have to understand our energetic technology and understand how that can work with the energetic law, which is nature. Once you understand energetic law, which is nature, and understand your human technology, your energetic human technology, you can work along with the law within your energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm here to educate people about. Understanding your human technology and how to operate with that knowing within the energetic law. Yeah. I don't like the word technology, do you know what Because that makes me think of machines. Yeah, but see, <laughs> here's the thing. If you look at machines, 
and look at robots and things that nature is just a replica of nature's technology. If you really look at it. So technology to me, nature is the original technology. Machine is nothing but a machines are nothing but the reflection of nature. That's all that it is. But I get, I mean, I get, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, a process that works. Mm -hmm. We don't understand how we, we don't understand how we work. How this is a, this is a, a fleshy robot, but we don't, under, we're in it, but we don't know how mm -hmm. to operate it because we don't understand mm -hmm. the ins and outs. We've been stripped of our <laughs> understanding of what this is. And we've been conditioned to think that we are actually the fleshy robot when we're not, we're inside of it operating it. And then we attach to all these extreme identities and we live our lives with this extreme identity of being black, extreme identity of being American, extreme identity of being whatever, when in actuality, even though I am a human, you can actually operate within this machine from the perspective of understanding that you're inside of it operating. And there's nothing wrong with having an identity as long as you're not extremely attached to it. Because whenever you're extremely attached to an identity, you're a slave to that identity. And then something that you might want to express, if it doesn't coincide with the collective identity structure, you are an outcast. So a lot of us suppress what we want to express because we don't want to disappoint the collective identity that we attached ourselves to. But see, I don't have that issue because I don't care. I do what I want to do and I don't care what nobody thinks. That's where we start. Exactly. Bring That's it full circle. Let's bring Break it full around. circle. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. So listen, I better say goodbye um, just because, I don't know, it's a long video for people to watch. <laughs> Um, okay. If, the, if there's any questions underneath, like, because I can't see all of them, feel free to go and, like, add some comments now. Okay. And uh, anybody who wants to, to, you know, ask anything more, please post stuff below. And then what I'll do is also I'll download this and put it up on my YouTube channel. I'll, I'll link it to you as well okay. so that you can do the same. Mm -hmm. And then anybody who wasn't here who wants to see it or wants to watch it again can watch it. And uh, maybe we'll do part three another time. Okay. But I promise not to wake you up on that road. Okay. Yeah, because you and London, you're five hours ahead. Five hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> all right. So it was a... Yeah, I'm really... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you go. You go. I was going to say it was a pleasure as always to connect with you, Beverly. And we will connect when I come back to London again, too. Yeah. Yeah, looking forward to it. And um, just... To see you in a happy space as well, like me as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, just really great to, to feel your energy and to uh, like, woo, flow in that conversation. It's been such good fun. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks so much. All right, thank you. <laughs> Bye for now. All right, peace.